So I think we're in business. We're in business and you can navigate your slides and everything. It's all ready. Yep, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. All Just right. Need to arrange so my screens here. With no further ado, I would like to <laughs> say welcome to Nikita Nikolaev uh, from uh, Birmingham University, who will give us this uh, talk on geometry and Borel resumability of exact WKP solutions. So please, Nikita. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as I always say on uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom seminars, if you can turn your camera on, uh, please do, because uh, it's always kind of much more pleasant to speak to faces rather than black squares. Um, uh, right. Okay, so I want to tell you about, uh, it's basically kind of a series of uh, projects, um, all surrounding the kind of general uh, theme of uh, WKB uh, analysis and in particular exact WKB and so there is there's a number of results um, in particular kind of one result that I'm um, uh, part of it is, is already published but part of it I'm still writing um, that I want to kind of announce um, regarding WKB solutions and then the other thing that I want to do is kind of propose a geometric and not what I think is a very nice geometric picture behind all this um, all this stuff okay so let me just kind of jump right in so um, basically the main object that I want to study are linear ODEs so it's a linear ODE in the you know in the complex domain uh, of order n um, and importantly uh, it's it's singularly perturbed so it has this uh, parameter h bar which we think of as small small complex number um, and um, the way it's perturbed in this uh, specific way, but quite uh, quite common um, in in examples, uh, which is that the differential operator uh, del by del x uh, that is multiplied by a single power of h bar. So this is a kind of very very common way uh, that linear differential operators are perturbed. And um, one thing I want to point out is that the coefficients here, which I call p, uh, they are well, they're holomorphic or more generally meromorphic functions. Uh, of x, uh, but they're also allowed to depend on h bar. And um, so here I'm sort of uh, implying that maybe I want some kind of polynomial dependence, which uh, encompasses a very large class of interesting situations in geometry and um, and elsewhere. Uh, but in principle, um, for the you know for the, what I'm about to describe, the dependence could be much more general. So they could in fact be kind of holomorphic functions in h bar, uh, which are like holomorphic in a sector of h bar uh, equal to zero uh, with some prescribed asymptotic, so it could be sort of much more general than that. Um, but you can just think that they are some kind of polynomials, uh, usually even just linear polynomials already, uh, um, or even just constant. When, like the the most common situation is when uh, these p's actually don't depend on h bar, and even that situation is is very very common and interesting. Um, okay, so two examples that I will think about. Um, one is a very familiar uh, Schrodinger equation. So it's a second order ODE. Uh, we have this kind of potential Q and you know this potential Q could also in principle depend on H bar in some possibly complicated way. Um, so that's example number one. And example number two is uh, an equation of order three. Uh, so it's a, this very, very specific equation. I wrote it down. Uh, it has a name called Burke nevins roberts equation. Um, it's It's very famous for um, a particular phenomenon that was discovered by studying this equation by by these people, and I will get uh, to this phenomenon. Um, so more generally, uh, you know, I I uh, wrote down an actual differential operator in a coordinate, you know, in the complex domain, very classical analysis from the 1960s type of uh, object. But we could think about something a bit more general geometrically. So I could replace the complex domain X by some algebraic curve. I'll think of it as compact, and so I'll, I'll equip it with some divisor where I would want the coefficients of my differential operator to possibly de develop singularities of some prescribed orders. Um, and what I want to study is um, it, I would replace this uh, differential equation, this linear OD, with a, with a linear differential operator of order n. And I will want it to be perturbed by this parameter h bar in some specific sense, which um, there is a there's a very precise way of making sense of this, but essentially what I want is that uh, if I 
if I look at the kind of Leibniz rule that a differential operator should satisfy, then at this limit h bar equal to zero, when I when I set uh, the parameter h bar equal to zero, then my differential operator kind of no longer becomes a differential operator; it just becomes uh, uh, something linear on functions. So that this uh, this equation may be may look a little bit funny, but there's a there's a good way of making sense of this. Um, right, or I could I could kind of think about it even more generally and replace instead of thinking about differential operators on line bundles, I can think of differential operators on on vector bundles, and in particular connections uh, connections on on vector bundles over these kind of wild curves, a curve with a with a divisor. Uh, so that that's maybe a more familiar object uh, geometrically. These are just um, as we well know maps uh, on sections. Uh, of a vector bundle, holomorphic vector bundle. And uh, so I have this uh, uh, h-bar in front of the word connection. That, that just means I want these families of h-bar connections. These families are very special in that um, the way they depend on h-bar is, uh, is there is this special fiber, the classical fiber, h-bar equal to zero, where my connection actually degenerates to a Higgs field. So uh, you can see it from the Leibniz rule for the, for the connection. So the, if, if I didn't have this h-bar here, the usual Leibniz, that would be the usual Leibniz rule for the connection. Uh, but in here, I'm sort of scaling the the only part of the Leibniz rule which is nonlinear on functions. It depends on the chord, uh, it depends on the on the derivative of the function um, that is scaled by h bar. And so when I set h bar equal to zero, this this term will die away, and, and I would get something linear. So that would be a Higgs field. So these are the kind of um, uh, these are the kind of families of connections uh, that I want to consider. And uh, well, um, so what I want to do is I kind of want to understand the WKB method uh, applied to all these kind of objects. So first of all, what is the WKB method? Um, I won't go into a great amount of detail, but basically uh, it amounts to uh, trying, you know, looking at this uh, linear ODE and solving it in some very effective uh, special way where I I, uh, I imagine, or I put as, a, as an ansatz, the so-called WQB ansatz, I put uh, that my solutions are of this very special form. They're kind of exponential of something, uh, which depends on h-bar as one over h-bar. And um, um, so you kind of plug this in and you, uh, and it turns out that this uh, is, is a very helpful ansatz because it leads to um, um, a, a kind of a simplification of your of your problem, um, uh, right? So, um, so I want to kind of address two questions today with, with regards to all this. So, first of all, um, kind of thinking a bit more analytically, uh, the question is: When does this WKB method uh, via the WKB ansatz where does that lead to solutions of my linear ODE with good asymptotics? Um, so the notion of good needs to be explained, but basically some type of asymptotic, some type of asymptotics that I can control. Asymptotics as h bar goes to zero. Um, so that's question number one that I want to address. And question number two is, what does it mean to write down the WQB ansatz, or what does it mean to apply the WQB method to these more general objects, um, which is a, you know, a differential operator on a line bundle, or even more generally, a, a connection on a vector bundle. And maybe uh, it's, uh, it's easier to see how possibly how one would go about applying the WQB method to a differential operator on a line bundle, because uh, ultimately, this uh, differential operator in a local uh, trivialization is nothing but this expression. So you just trivialize it and, and apply the WKB method. Um, use the computations that you're familiar in the WQB analysis and somehow use that to deduce some information about uh, P. There is, a, there is of course a problem, which is that uh, you would need to be able to explain exactly how your constructions depend on all these trivializations and coordinates that you've picked in order to represent this uh, differential operator on a line bundle as this explicit, as this explicit ODE. Um, so, that that is a type of question that I will be able to um, address, um, but uh, but actually, so if you kind of go to the world of connections, uh, slightly more general than uh, than differential operators, then the question becomes even more um, unclear. Uh, of how do you apply that? What does it mean to apply the WQB method to a connection? It's not it's not completely clear. 
Um, and if you want in very practical terms, uh, never mind kind of um, abstract vector bundles, connections, uh, all that language, um, very practically what that means is, suppose you have a differential system, a coupled differential system, which is not a scalar linear differential equation. You have a couple differential system and you could ask a question, what does it mean to apply the WKB methods to a differential system without converting it into a differential, a scalar differential operator? Of course, we know that um, every scalar differential operator can be promoted to a differential system just by using this simple trick in ODEs where you, um, you know, you, you declare the first derivative of a function to be the new variable, the second derivative to be a new variable as well, if you have this kind of column vector of new variables that gives you a differential system. So every every scalar differential operator induces a system, um, but not the other way around. Or, or rather, it is possible to go the other way around, but uh, you always, uh, in general, you will get new si singular points. So uh, the scalar differential operator will have new, scale, uh, new uh, singular points, so-called apparent singularities, um, which come uh, basically from the fact that your, your gauge transformations need to vanish somewhere. Uh, when you when you do uh, uh, this type of operation. So without doing this, uh, suppose I just have a differential system. Uh, I want to apply the WKB method. How do I how do I do that? So that, that would be a, a way to address that question. Um, OK, so let me remind you a little bit about how the WKB method uh, works. So what I do is I take that WKB ansatz, which is exponential one over h bar of something, and I plug that into my uh, ODE. Um, and basically the way you should think of it is a, is a kind of a, a, a rather complicated change of the unknown variable. That's, that's, that's what it is. Um, so uh, my previous variable, so in this equation, my pre previous unknown variable is Psi. I'm trying to solve for Psi. And now I'm doing this change of variables. Now my new variable is S. And so I'm going to rewrite my problem uh, as a problem for S. And um, so if you, if you plug it in, compute the derivatives, you end up with a, an ODE of order one less, so of order n minus one. Uh, and it basically looks like this. Uh, uh, that's the, that's the uh, fundamental form of it. Um, and the, the, the thing to note is that although it's of order one less, it is nonlinear. It is a nonlinear scalar uh, ODE, uh, nonlinear because there is a, because my unknown variable here is to the power of n here. So for, for instance, oops, for instance, um, in the two examples that I had, uh, so the Schrodinger equation gives me uh, a first order. So Schrodinger equation is the second order linear ODE. Um, this uh, nonlinear ODE obtained via the WKB ansatz is, is now uh, a first order ODE, but nonlinear. So it's square, it's quadratic in the unknown. Uh, that's a very famous equation called, uh, the Riccati equation, uh, or singularly perturbed Riccati equation. And then for the for the other example, the Burke Nevins Roberts uh, example, so that one was ODE of order three. So this now becomes an ODE of order two, nonlinear and cubic in the unknown. Um, and uh, well, so the the point of the WKB ansatz is that um, once I've converted my problem into uh, into trying to understand this ODE, this nonlinear ODE, as opposed to the linear ODE on the previous slide, this one is actually easy, very easy to solve in power series in HBAR. So if I just plug in um, a power series in HBAR, um, then um, I get these uh, kind of recursive towers, a recursive tower uh, of, um, of linear equations, none of which is a differential equation anymore. They're all, uh, they're all literally linear algebra just linear algebra solving um, infinitely many linear algebra problems. Um, so th the way to state it is, the way I stated it here, is a, a kind of formal existence and uniqueness theorem. This is a very classical uh, result, although it's not sometimes not particularly easy to find a precise statement of it in, in even in textbooks. But basically the way it goes like is like this. Um, I'll fix a base point. That's basically uh, around this base point, I will be solving uh, my differential equation. And I want to uh, choose this base point generically, which I'll explain in a second. So if I, if I did that, uh, then what I'm guaranteed is that there will be n 
uh, formal solutions, uh, formal meaning the formal power series in each bar with coefficients which are holomorphic germs. Um, so I call them S hat uh, labeled by I, S I. Um, and uh, the their properties that they are, uh, they are kind of, you solve for them recursively and they're uniquely determined by their leading orders. And the leading orders, uh, these uh, lambdas, I call them lambdas, they're just roots of uh, a, of a degree n polynomial. Um, this is like um, in differential equations, uh, they usually call this like a characteristic equation or a leading order characteristic equation of, uh, of the differential equation. So here, the coefficients a are just leading orders of the coefficients p in the, in the differential equation. Um, and uh, so once I have these s, once I have these n, uh, formal power series solutions S, then what I can do is I can just take my WKB ansatz, put them into that formula and get uh, some formal expression, uh, which I call Psi, psi hat. And those are the formal WKB solutions. Um, um, those are called formal WKB solutions. They're solutions to the ODE. Um, the uh, you kind of the appropriate way to make sense of, of them, uh, kind of in what sense are they formal solutions? What kind of objects are they? Um, they're, they're obviously not power series, uh, just because I have, you know, exponential of one over h bar. Um, that's not a power series in h bar. Uh, but what what you could do is you could uh, you could factor out the the one over h bar part in the exponential, and then what remains is just positive powers in h bar. In fact, uh, you know, you can rewrite it as an actual power series. So what you really have is a is an object that looks like a, an exponential prefactor that has a one over h bar. Um, in the in the exponent times a formal power series. So these things have a name um, like an, uh, you could call them an, an exponential power series or a, or a trans series. Uh, more general trans series would be, for example, an infinite sum of simple uh, objects like this. So this would be a, the simplest kind of type of a trans series. Um, so. Right, so I promised to explain what this generically means. Uh, so generically means away from turning points. Turning points are just zeros of the discriminant of this uh, of this polynomial equation. So the reason you would want to avoid that is uh, if I if I'm sitting at a point which is a uh, zero of a discriminant, I know that some of the some of the solutions of this polynomial are coincident. So as as holomorphic functions, these leading order solutions, they would have a branch point singularity at that point. So they would uh, technically not be holomorphic functions uh, in a neighborhood of, uh, of such a point. So that's why you want to avoid that. Um, and uh, okay, so these uh, these formal WKB solutions are really nice uh, because, well, uh, I've essentially written down a formula for them right here in front of you. Um, and, uh, and that's not a kind of, I'm not really sweeping too much under the rug. Uh, they really are kind of excellent in the sense that they're very, very computable objects. So if you think the only analytic uh, aspect of what has gone on here is solving this uh, leading order polynomial, that basically, you know, that in general kind of involves the implicit function theorem, which could be a little bit not particularly explicit as the name suggests. Uh, but after that, everything is just a kind of a rec recursive linear algebra. Um, and so, um, uh, so you, in principle, can compute uh, these uh, formal WKB solutions. You can compute them to any order you like, as you know, as long as you have the patience. Uh, you can you can write down them very very explicitly. But uh, they come with a kind of massive caveat, which is that they are almost always divergent. They are uh, they are convergent only in uh, very extreme kind of extremely uninteresting situations. Uh, most of the times they are genuinely divergent. And uh, right, and uh, if you're not quite familiar with this, I want to note that they are divergent not because, you know, there's some kind of funny business going on with uh, with some kind of exponential prefactor, which obviously has a an essential singularity at h bar equal to zero. So that's, that's not the source of divergence. This, um, this, you know, this exponential prefactor, of course, Indeed, it has an essential singularity at the origin, but apart from that, it's a perfectly uh, understandable holomorphic function. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong with it. Just it's just singular. You know, not not too bad. 
Um, but it's this power series here on the right, which is multiplied. That that's the source of divergence. So that is a that, there's an ordinary power series in H bar, and in general, it has zero radius of convergence. Okay, so um, so that's kind of uh, bad news because we've developed these very nice, very computable solutions to our differential equation, but they're not actually solutions because they're uh, ge genuinely formal objects. So you could ask a question, um, can I take these formal solutions and somehow upgrade them to holomorphic solutions? So in other words, can I, can I um, you know, find actual true solutions, analytic both in X and H bar, such that I can actually plug in you know, a value of X and a value of H bar and, and expect a number uh, to come out of this? Can I plug them in uh, such that um, the, these formal WKB solutions, I could interpret them as a kind of asymptotic or perturbative expansion of these solutions, of these true solutions. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, this is just a very classical kind of asymptotic existence theorem. You can always lift uh, an asymptotic power series to a holomorphic function. Um, and then uh, th th that lift in general is not going to be a solution to your problem, but you can kind of modify it by a sub-exponential sub correction such that uh, you you can get a lift um, which is a holomorphic solution. Uh, the, the problem with this approach is that uh, psi i's, so these uh, kind of holomorphic WKB solutions obtained this way are highly non-unique uh, and, uh, and, and they're not very constructive because it's uh, es essentially uh, uh, requires constructing um, a lift of, a, of an asymptotic power series, and that's not a very explicit operation. Um, and actually, uh, like it, I say, they're highly non-unique. It's it's kind of um, it's even um, I mean it's a kind of completely disastrous situation because even even the set of all possible lifts is uh, not, it's it kind of almost impossible to describe it in, in, in any sort of uh, effective way, just, just because um, it all hin hinges upon uh, this arbitrary lift and correction. And that is a very, uh, you kind of, in the process of uh, when you do this, there's very little control on, uh, on the asymptotics of such. So this is just a kind of a general problem with um, what they call Kind of the deficiency of Poincaré asymptotics as opposed to other more refined types of asymptotics. Okay, so um, right, so so you can lift it to a solution, uh, but uh, not in any kind of uh, good, uh, effective way. So maybe a better question is, can I upgrade these formal WKB solutions to holomorphic solutions in some kind of canonical way, in a, in a way that I can actually control? So you know, mathematically, we would think of this as, can I essentially, can I formulate a, a kind of existence and uniqueness condition such that I can nail my uh, holomorphic lifts of solutions in some specific way? Can I nail them uniquely? And um, uh, well, uh, since many of you are uh, part of this grant, uh, Renew Quantum, uh, I'm sure it would come as no surprise to you uh, that the way I would interpret that question is, can I uh, Borel resum uh, these formal WKB solutions? And uh, and the answer uh, turns out to be yes, you can, uh, subject to some uh, conditions uh, basically on um, on these uh, roots of the characteristic polynomial lambdas, or, or rather some uh, complicated global geometry determined by these roots. Um, so, yeah, so let me kind of uh, give you uh, the main results in a kind of a, a rough statement, and then I'll go and delve more deeply into into them. So the first the first result is that uh, the formal WKB solutions, as I described them, psi one through psi n, are Borel summable away from what I'll call relevant Stokes lines. So the, this is the the semi global geometry which I'm about to describe, and I want to kind of emphasize that this problem of um, whether or not formal WKB solutions are Borel summable or not. This, is, this has uh, been a, a problem for quite a long time now. Um, and I, um, there's, there have been sort of partial solutions um, to uh, in rank two, so for equations of order two. Um, and uh, so I, 
a year ago, I, I published a paper which kind of gives a very general uh, answer to that. Um, and then the uh, the problem for higher order, so order three and higher, uh, that uh, that has been a kind of a, a difficult, very difficult problem uh, for a long time. And I'm very happy to uh, basically announce that I, I I think I have a solution, um, so which I'm writing uh, essentially as we speak. <laughs> Right. Okay. So that's that's number one, um, and number two uh, has to do more with this geometric uh, understanding of what what's going on behind the the exact WKB. And uh, so the way I would roughly state it is like this: so uh, the Borel resummations of these formal WKB solutions, which I call psi one through psi n without the hats, so they are uniquely determined uh, by a, a very strong asymptotic condition. So. Uh, in other words, this is this Borel resummability is stated as a as an existence and uniqueness result. So there's a, it's almost like a Cauchy uh, initial value problem, which uniquely specifies holomorphic solutions of my ODE that satisfy a, a, a very specific condition, um, um, and uh, and these solutions are the Borel resummations of formal WKB solutions. Um, and because it's because it's stated as this very strong kind of initial value problem, solution to, a, to an initial value problem, uh, the asymptotic condition is a very geometric uh, constraint in the sense that it doesn't, it, uh, it's independent of coordinates, it's independent of trivialization, it's independent of all those choices that we, that we make to go from basically pure geometry to analysis. And so that means the solutions are nailed down uh, uniquely in a very kind of geometrically invariant sense. So that means um, uh, that means um, we kind of have a um, we're, we're allowed to write down a very geometrically invariant meaning to the WKB solutions on a general line bundle over a general Riemann surface for a for a general uh, differential operator, H bar deformed differential operator. And um, uh, what's more is that, uh, as I will describe at the end, um, there's a point of view that I uh, that I can propose uh, on the WKB method as a kind of method for studying uh, splittings of vector bundles or oppers, oppers structures on uh, on vector bundles with connection. Um, and um, if you formulate the WKB method that way, then again, uh, you uh, you can kind of use this geometrically invariant existence uniqueness type result to actually deduce uh, a, a notion of a kind of a WKB, exact WKB flat section for a, for a connection. So, um, right, so okay, so this this kind of main result uh, statements one to three, they address the, the first, the, the two questions that I posed in the very first slide. Um, okay, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Just that, so, so somehow, uh, here it's in, in three, it's a splitting because you have sort of split this uh, roots into n different roots, right? And I was mm -hmm. just wondering if there is sort of an even more global statement that says that there is some kind of construction that the WKB method results in, which does not use this splitting at all. I mean, it's just some kind of object or that, that doesn't uh, get any, so that you don't have to choose these uh, different uh, enumeration of the roots or something like this. Definitely, I think, um, I, so uh, uh, there, there'll be several things that I'll say during the talk, which I think kind of altogether perhaps answer your question. So okay. um, yeah, indeed. So one of, one of the things that I want to do is I want to get rid of this enumeration of roots basically to, to kind of encode it completely geometrically. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, so um, so to, to explain the main result, let me uh, kind of briefly explain what this uh, semi-global geometry of these lambdas, uh, what that looks like. So, and, and I'll basically uh, cover it in two ways. First, I'll, I'll explain to you what this the way it's traditionally explained. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll give a, a geometric point of view, uh, uh, more or less answering your question, uh, Jon. Um, so, what, what we're interested in here are what I call WKB trajectories, which are um, these, um, they're kind of real trajectories, uh, which locally 
are given as these uh, level sets of the imaginary part of differences of lambda i and lambda j. So lambda i and lambda j, remember they are roots of the characteristic polynomial, so I take their difference, I integrate this, uh, some kind of weird integral, and I, and I look at the imaginary parts of them. And then, um, so I actually want a trajectory out of it, so I want uh, directionality emanating from the base point that I always kind of uh, keep in mind. Um, so uh, the, you know, this, uh, this trajectory is given as the level set of the imaginary part, and I can use the real part as uh, to give me um, the d directionality. So, um, so I call these, um, uh, what do I call it, gamma i j is the WQB trajectory emanating from uh, a particular base point. And uh, I can use, uh, so yeah, I've already mentioned, I can use the, the real part of this uh, function that I'm, that I'm integrating. I can use that as a kind of natural flow time parameter. As I flow along this green, green curve, that gives me a real number. That's, that's how long I've been flowing. And um, so I, I'll use this time t to kind of a, give a, a semi-global um, uh, understand semi-global properties of these trajectories. So uh, um, I'll say that a trajectory is non-singular if it's infinitely long. So that means I can flow it uh, for t uh, unbounded, um, and uh, along the way I will not encounter any any singular points, or in particular I will not encounter any any turning points. Um, and if, on the other hand, it does flow into a singular point, uh, uh, a turning point, then um, uh, a trajectory is called singular. So here are two kind of very typical situations. So normally what happens, uh, so these, these are turning points, this red dot here, uh, that's a pole, pole of my equation, and what usually happens is um, a, a non-singular trajectory, uh, it flows out of this uh, base point x0, and it kind of winds logarithmically into a pole, and uh, the um, the amount of time it takes for it to do so is infinite. Um, so this this real number, if you if you literally integrate lambda i minus lambda j along this trajectory, that would be a, a, an infinite, uh, you would get a, an infinite number. Um, however, um, uh, if um, it could happen that if I, you know, I start flowing uh, using this ij trajectory, if start flowing from the base point, I could encounter a turning point. Um, and uh, the um, what character basically what characterizes such a trajectory is that this the amount of fly the amount of time that it would take to flow along this trajectory is actually finite. So, um, in fact, in um, um, in the theory of uh, like quadratic differentials, where they study such uh, um, trajectories a lot, they they even refer to turning points as finite singular points, me meaning that uh, these are singular points which you can reach in finite time. Um, one thing you can kind of putting a bit more of a kind of differential geometry hat on, uh, you know, the reason I'm really using these words here, uh, flow, time, infinite finite time is because we're really flowing some kind of holomorphic vector field. Um, and what I want from this flow is for it to be complete. Um, complete, uh, not globally, but I want the local flow to be complete. So, uh, or in fact, to be forward complete. I have, I have a notion of what it means to flow forward or backward. I'm always going to flow forward and I always want this flow to be complete. And if it's not complete, uh, then I'm in trouble. Uh, that's the situation I want to avoid. Um, so, um, Here's a here's a kind of a semi uh, semi local semi global picture of what what goes on. Um, the all the trajectories which uh, which are finite, which are sorry, which are singular, so they flow into a turning point in finite time. I'll color them in orange. And uh, what you get uh, in a generic situation is that uh, these uh, singular trajectories they form a graph. Um, they form a graph on your kind of on your surface. Um, and uh, here, this example is, uh, the way I drew it, is very specific to order two equations, n equals two, and uh, higher order will be on the, on the next slide. Um, the, the very kind of uh, particular situation that you get in uh, order two is that uh, this graph, which is called the Stokes graph, um, it's always uh, what they call a square graph. Uh, in a generic situation, it's a square graph, so it has precisely four uh, singular edges made up of singular trajectories. 
um, which are called Stokes uh, Stokes lines, um, and uh, these four edges. Uh, sorry, sorry. The, uh, um, so there's four edges, and there's also four vertices, uh, as a, a square should have, um, and uh, there's two uh, two turning points and two two poles. So you kind of this is the uh, the typical picture that you get. Um, in higher rank, however, for when I when I look at uh, equations of order three and higher, the situation becomes much more complicated uh, because uh, just returning to this for a second, the reason uh, you know the reason the picture here is so simple is because uh, when the order of the equation is two, uh, I only have two roots lambda lambda one and lambda two, and all I'm interested in are the differences of them, and there's really only one difference. Uh, there's lambda one minus lambda two or lambda two minus lambda one and they're of course negatives of each other so as far as level sets are concerned the level sets are absolutely identical for either difference the only thing that would change is the directionality so for, so that's why for instance here on this picture i drew you know these are the level sets these are the kind of level sets which are singular but i didn't drew but but i didn't draw the uh, the orientations on them because those would depend more on the choice of the labels Whereas in higher rank, um, now I have uh, many more roots than just two. So this example is uh, the trajectory structure for the BNR equation, the Berg -Nev uh, Nevins Roberts. Um, in so that's an order three equation. So we have uh, we have six differences, uh, and up to a sign we have three differences. So here um, I actually drew them with orientations, and these red wiggly lines they are branch cuts because of course the three roots uh they are some kind of multi-valued uh, holomorphic functions so well I, I i can't remember exactly how i labeled them but um so one difference uh you know gives me an orientation like this which looks kind of very similar to you know the, at least the local structure looks very similar to what happens in rank two but uh more kind of uh, in a more semi-global uh, point of view it's uh, it's it's kind of much well it's it's perturbed so uh, you know these trajectories they have to go into the different sheet and then they become you know on a different sheet they become trajectories for a different pair of uh, of differences and and so on and so forth so so it's it's a kind of it becomes a very complicated picture and here i i uh, you see i i drew all the different trajectories in a different picture but um i'm thinking of these pictures as all being in the whatever in the x plane and so i i'm technically supposed to draw them all kind of juxtaposed on one another and this just becomes kind of a complete nightmare as you can as you can imagine uh but uh okay fine but if i kind of collect all the singular uh trajectories all the stokes lines then i get stokes graph right so i put it in quotation marks uh importantly because it's it's not a graph really anymore uh, the reason it's, it's not a graph is that it has uh, it has intersection points like this one, which are not vertices of the graph. So this this point is neither uh, a turning point nor a singular point. It's a it's a perfectly nice smooth point on the curve from the point of view of the differential equation, but the graph is self intersecting, so it's not a graph. So you could call it a network, a Stokes network. Um, right. Okay, so that's um, that's what's kind of traditionally uh, said, uh, and I want I, I kind of want to make a point that you know because this picture is so complicated, um, as a geometer, in my immediate reaction is that well, it just kind of it means to me that we're drawing these pictures on the wrong space. Um, there must be some other geometric space uh, in play where this actually kind of makes sense. So, okay, so here's my proposal for this. Um, so, <clears throat> differential geometrically, you can, you can understand that these uh, trajectories of type ij are really just leaves of a foliation given by uh, an abelian differential. This abelian differential is just this difference, lambda i minus lambda j. Um, okay, so um, let's return to this uh, characteristic equation. Um, that characteristic equation, as geometers, we recognize that it's it's just a spectral curve, uh, uh, which is a it's a subset of a cotangent bundle. Here, I actually do the twist 
by the divisor, but whatever, uh, you can ignore the, the details. But the, the idea is that I have, uh, this is my base curve X, uh, my Riemann surface, that's the X plane. And then it has the cotangent bundle, the total space of the cotangent bundle above it. And inside the cotangent bundle, there's a, there's a subset, um, submanifold, um, which is given as the zero locus, uh, basically of this equation. Um, so, so, so that, that is a spectral curve. Um, and it's, it comes equipped with an additional structure, which is which is a very important structure, which is just the pullback of the canonical differential and the cotangent bundle, which is called lambda. So that's uh, if you're a, if you're a physicist, uh, that would be the PDQ, the luvial form. Um, it's that's a very natural form on the cotangent bundle. By the way, on this uh, on this twisted cotangent bundle, where you twist it by the divisor, there's also uh, a canonical one form, uh, meromorphic, um, but it has all the, essentially all the same properties so um you can you can take that differential you can pull it back to the spectral curve and that's what i call lambda and we we know quite well that uh these uh roots that i wrote down before lambda i uh, they are really just local expressions for for this canonical one form lambda uh, that's why they're not well defined uh in terms of the coordinate x which is a coordinate on the base around turning points that's why you need to avoid turning points but if i pull everything up to the spectral curve then it's just there's a single differential one form lambda and all i'm doing is i'm taking local trivializations of it uh and when i write down the coordinates x i'm just uh you know identifying a piece a sheet uh, of the spectral curve with some open subset downstairs that's really what i'm doing Okay, so I want to kind of give a same, a very similar kind of interpretation for these uh, one forms lambda i minus lambda j dx. And oops, my proposal is like this. So there's a kind of a little cute lemma, which is that uh, these lambda i minus lambda j one forms, they are local expressions of what I would call the adjoint canonical differential denoted by ad lambda, not necessarily the best notation or terminology, but let's just stick with it for now. Um, and it's uh, it's a differential on the following uh, curve, which is obtained canonically from the spectral curve. Uh, so my spectral curve is sigma, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the fiber product of sigma with with itself over x. So it's is defined by this by this diagram, um, and um, so this fiber product has two maps to sigma pi one and pi two. And uh, the way this uh, adjoint canonical differential is defined is by pulling back lambda to uh, this adjoint sigma uh, in two ways. So just pull, pull it back by pi one and pull it back by pi two, it takes a difference. Um, okay, so, so I call this a joint spectral curve. Okay, again, not necessarily the best terminology. Uh, but okay, so what's the meaning of this curve? Well, so what, what is the fiber product? The fiber product is uh, pairs of points on sigma, uh, which are ordered. They're ordered pairs of points on sigma. So, so that means, so here I'm kind of doing a, a cartoonish example. So, so here's my base point, base curve X. This is the cotangent bundle. Green thing is sigma. Um, and so I, I fix a point uh, X, uh, or, sorry, I fix a blue point in the base. And that gives me a bunch of points in the fiber uh, of sigma. So any, if I choose any any pair of them, like, let's say these two, and I choose them in an ordered way, so I say this one is plus, this one is minus, that uh, pair of these points minus plus, that gives me a point in the adjoint spectral curve. So a spectral curve parameterizes these points, uh, these ordered pairs of points in the same fiber um, over x. Um, I'm cheating here very slightly uh, in that actually when you when you take this um, fiber product it's uh, it's genuinely a scheme because it has a non-reduced divisor uh, which is the diagonal copy of sigma but whatever if you just remove that as a divisor then uh, this adjoint spectral curve actually is smooth it's a smooth curve and because it, it comes equipped with a natural differential it has a canonical embedding into the cotangent bundle so it is itself a spectral curve uh, over x of some other object. 
Um, okay, and then, so once you've introduced this, a joint spectral curve with an adjoint differential, then you kind of translate all the definitions that I uh, made before into this more geometric language where turning points are uh, ramification points uh, of the adjoint spectral curve. They're not ramification points of the spectral curve, but of the spectral uh, of the adjoint spectral curve. That's that's a kind of uh, crucial dis uh, distinction. Um, the adjoint spectral curve and the spectral curve they they are ramified over the same locus in X. So as points in X, turning points actually are the same. But uh, but really we we need to think of them as uh, points where the adjoint spectral curve is ramified rather than the spectral curve. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's one, number one. And then uh, the WKB trajectories, all these different uh, zero loci of like lambda lambda one minus lambda two imaginary part, uh, they now just become a very uh, kind of global geometric object, which is uh, foliation. The leaves of a foliation of a single abelian differential add lambda on this uh, adjoint spectral curve add sigma. Um, and then, and then basically everything you know about what happened in rank two for equations two, where we had a single abelian differential on the spectral curve, um, and we constructed the foliation out of that abelian differential. All of the terminology, all the constructions, just translate uh, directly to the setting of the adjoint spectral curve. So, what is the Stokes uh, Stokes graph? Well, it's the locus of um, uh, singular or critical trajectories of this abelian differential. Um, yeah. The, uh, any questions about this geometric Mark, proposal? Yeah, well, I had one, namely, I mean, normally we formulate term, uh, things in terms of the Hitchin vibration, right, or the Hitchin map with, uh, you know, higher order differentials. And so uh, could you maybe, I mean, say a little bit about how this single one is related to those yeah, so um, so yeah, so I think um, I think um, so okay, so yeah, of course, here I have you know the spectral curve uh, just comes from a point in the Hitchin base, um, uh, but I don't necessarily have a Higgs uh, field uh, attached to it. But if I did, then I think I would be able to explain exactly to you which uh, which Higgs field this spectral curve corresponds to, and that is um, uh, the Higgs field. So if you have a Higgs field on the vector bundle E, like mm -hmm. E phi, that's the Higgs field. Um, its spectral curve is sigma. Uh, the way to get uh, the adjoint spectral curve, and that's where the terminology actually comes from, mm -hmm. is is the following: is I look on the endomorphism of E. That's a vector bundle of rank n squared. Mm -hmm. uh, that has a Higgs field as well, which is just bracketing with phi. Yeah. And uh, if you compute the spectral curve of that Higgs field, then you get this adjoint spectral curve. Yeah. So that, that's the reason for the terminology. Yeah, so it's a sort of rather canonical construction in terms of Higgs problems, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But even kind of geometrically, like um, what, one uh, one use of this adjoint spectral curve is that even if I don't have a differential in place, um, and I want to, well, okay, so this relates to kind of other uh, construction of uh, abelianization on character varieties and representations of fundamental groups. So I, there, you know, I don't really, I don't even necessarily need to work with Riemann surfaces. I just maybe just need a two-dimensional surface and so on. So it turns out that this construction of this adjoint spectral curve, or, or rather this fiber product, is essential to uh, do abelianization in higher, in higher rank, uh, like this Durham sorry, not Durham, Betty abelianization in higher rank. Again, because it has the, you know, the, the kind of internal structure is exactly uh, suited for, um, for kind of a very important aspect of differential equations, which is, um, well, I, so I, I normally like to say it like this, uh, you know, when you, when you study differential equations, one thing that's really important are kind of filtrations by, by growth rates of solutions. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to understand if you have kind of two solutions, which one grows faster. Mm -hmm. But but actually, uh, in, if you just care, if you just care about filtrations, which is geometrically the only thing that really makes sense, 
then all you need is not actual rates of uh, growth or decay, but rather relative rates of growth and decay. You need to be able to tell which solution grows faster, but you don't really need to know how fast a solution grows. That That is a kind of a geometrically less well-defined notion. Um, so what you need are not the eigenvalues, uh, you know, uh, of, for instance, your residue or, or your monogamy matrix, not the eigenvalues, but rather differences of eigenvalues. That's what you really need. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, joint spectral curve is somehow exactly the object that you need uh, uh, to combinatorially encode the idea of differences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It just, it has it encoded itself. So that's why it's, it, I think it's a kind of a beautiful, beautiful object. Beautiful and very simple. That's what I really love about it. It's so simple. <laughs> um, right. Um, yeah. So uh, what else did I want to say? Um, yeah. So the, so the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, so I'm defining the Stokes graph no longer on uh, the base X curve, but rather on this multi-sheeted, much more topologically complicated adjoint spectral curve. So, you know, my base curve could really be literally P1, uh, but the adjoint spectral curve could be high, high genus and it's uh, high degree over, over P1. And I'm defining this graph and it's a genuine graph now. It has, uh, it's a square graph. So, it, it, you know, it, it's, its faces are quadrilaterals, four edges made up of four Stokes lines, uh, four vertices, two of them are turning points, two of them are poles. So the structure, the combinatorial structure is completely uh, obvious, kind of completely the same from what we know uh, about equations in rank two. So I'm defining the Stokes graph on this adjoint spectral curve. And then the reason the Stokes network uh, downstairs in the X uh, plane. The reason that's so complicated is because basically what we're doing is we, we take this Stokes graph and we project it down a multi-sheeted uh, high degree map. So of course, uh, you know, even though I have a graph which is not self-intersecting, but when I project it down, suddenly, you know, you're going to have self-intersection and, and uh, all, all kinds of complicated phenomena. But, uh, but this spectral, this adjoint spectral curve really kind of uh, um, separates separates all those phenomena into into one global object which is very well behaved so that's the message here uh, is that is that more or less clear um any questions about this okay so um so how much how much time do i actually have uh well you're almost out of time Oh, because we started, yeah, okay. We started about so, 15 minutes late. So, I mean, actually, maybe you have five more minutes or something like this, uh, say to 20 past or something like this. Okay, so, right. So, let me just uh, skip to uh, give you the, the main statement of one of the theorems. And um, the statement is like this. <clears throat> so, um, once you once you understand this structure of uh, um, this kind of Stokes graph on this multi-sheeted covering, uh, you um, you can um, you can use uh, you can use those foliations. Uh, you can, sorry, you can use that single foliation to to to, uh, to understand um, you know what what would it mean to flow a point uh, in multiple uh, directions. Um, and uh, and make sure that uh, all those flows are complete, or like, uh, all the trajectories are infinite. So um, so the statement is is like this. So if I fix an ordinary point uh, x naught, which is not a turning point, and I and I uh, fix a root lambda i uh, leading root. Uh, uh, so so that what that really means is I'm fixing a point on the spectral curve uh, above x naught. Um, so, uh, so what I what I'm going to assume uh, this is the kind of geometrically complicated assumption, which is that the, this WKB flow, the total WKB flow um, out of this base point, that is non-singular. So, uh, right. So, uh, 
so the conclusion is is like this. Um, if I if I look at these uh, formal WKB solutions that I constructed before, so in this case I I fixed the root lambda i, so I'll look at psi i formal WKB solution. Uh, that thing is uniformly Borel summable near this base point. Um, and in fact, it is the unique solution uh, which has um, asymptotic well, the way I say it asymptotically smooth fact uh, factorial growth. Uh, uniformly as h bar goes to zero in the right half plane, uniformly both in x and in the direct uh, in the directions in the in the h bar plane. Um, and the uh, the kind of initial value problem is that uh, it's I want it to be normalized in some particular way at the base point. That's a that's a kind of a simple uh, just a simple normalization condition. But then the the really uh, important uh, condition is that the asymptotic expansion in the sense of exponential asymptotics, the asymptotic expansion of this uh, um, um, of this analytic function is the formal Borel, uh, sorry, is the formal WKB solution that uh, that I constructed. Um, does, does that does that make sense? Right. Okay. So. Uh, okay, so I, of course I have uh, outline of the proof, which I'll just skip. But um, I can uh, I can explain that uh, maybe after after the talk if if anyone's interested. But the very last thing that I want to say, and I I realize that I almost have no time for this, but I want to at least just indicate um, the kind of geometric point of view on the WKB method uh, for connections. What will you need to do for connections? And and um, so the 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 way I would like to formulate it is like this. Um, suppose I have an OPA, uh, which is a, a vector bundle with a connection, and the connection is filtered in in some specific way. And actually, um, I, actually, I need uh, I need even less than having an OPA. I really just need an extension. So exactly what I wrote here. Uh, suppose I have an extension of vector bundles, which is not necessarily a flat extension, meaning that E has a connection, but the connection does not necessarily restrict to E prime. The way uh, I want to formulate uh, the WKB problem, the geometric WKB pro problem, is a kind of problem of finding a splitting of this um, of this extension, uh, which is Nabla invariant. So in particular, you know, if, if E prime were a flat subbundle so that the connection nub would restrict to E prime, then kind of uh, you'd, you'd already have solved the WKB problem. There is no WKB problem to solve. But in general, um, your extension would not be flat. And what you want to do is you want to find a splitting such that uh, um, which is nubly invariant. So that's the WKB problem. And here is the uh, kind of the the genius of the WKB method stated in uh, geometric terms. Here's what you do. Here's the method of solving this this kind of problem. And it goes as follows. You first you fix a reference uh, reference pair where first you just split the bundle in any odd way. Um, obviously not necessarily flat. Um, so I call that splitting E prime plus E double prime. That's just some splitting of this um, of this sequence, and you um, on this split bundle you fix a diagonal connection, call it uh, nubble prime and nubble double prime. And here's then here's what you do: you use this reference uh, splitting to simplify your problem, to basically reduce the number of degrees of freedom that you have to care about. And it goes as follows: so I'm now going to think of my splitting W that I'm searching for as a map from E double prime to this split bundle E prime plus E double prime, and I'm going to formulate uh, the problem of looking for W as a, as a problem of finding a gauge transformation which fixes uh, a filtration. So in other words, a unipotent gauge transformation. So that means, um, you know, I'm looking for a gauge transformation in this form. And in particular, I want this thing to be unipotent. So I'll, I'll look for W in, uh, in a form which just fixes E double prime. Uh, sorry, which fixes E prime. Um, and so the only, uh, I've reduced uh, the problem of finding W to a problem of finding uh, kind of a smaller amount of data, which is which is this S. S is this off-diagonal map. Uh, okay, so maybe this, sound, this might sound 
kind of silly. Why why would you want to do that? Um, and the reason is is the following. I also so so far I've just used the the reference splitting. Now I'm going to use the reference connection. Um, so I'm going to write the connection nabla that I'm given. I'm going to write it in terms of the reference diagonal connection. So the difference, of course, is going to be some endomorphism, which I'll call phi. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use apply this gauge transformation to this uh, connection written in terms of uh, my reference diagonal connection. And I'm going to state the condition of uh, what it means for W to be an invariant splitting. I'm going to uh, reformulate that as requiring that the gauge transform connection is lower triangular or, or upper triangular. It just needs to preserve a filtration. So, um, so if you if you do that computation, you just do this gauge transformation, uh, compute a few derivatives. What you find is that this condition of W being an invariant, a nabla invariant splitting amounts to uh, making sure that you know the lower left corner or, or upper right corner, depending on how you set up your gauge transformation. Let's say the lower left corner of the gauge transform connection needs to vanish for it to be in the upper triangular form. And uh, the lower left corner uh, amounts to an expression that looks like this. And so this this expression, I call it the geometric Riccati equation. So um, remember the Riccati equation was quadratic in the unknown variable and it was first order uh, in the in the derivative. So we, we're kind of seeing the same thing. So here, S is the thing, is my unknown. Uh, this equation is quadratic in S. Here's my quadratic term. Um, and it's also order one in the derivative. I'm, I'm differentiating using this diagonal connection. I'm differentiating S. Um, uh, right, so my the next slide that I have is uh, explaining this in the example of a Schrodinger equation, but I think I have no time for that. Uh, but if, if you want, I can explain it after the talk. Um, I'll just finish by saying that um, this is my proposal for what it means to kind of do uh, WKB analysis in the geometric setting where you don't have, co uh, you don't have, you know, you don't want to choose a coordinate. You don't want to choose trivialization. You just have a connection and uh, uh, my, um, uh, kind of uh, the point uh, the point I make is that uh, all you need in order to proceed with WKB is you need uh, your bundle to be an extension, an extension of vector bundles. So in particular, uh, if um, your connection comes from a scalar differential operator or a differential operator on the line bundle, the way you would promote that to a vector bundle with connection is you would apply the jet functor. So you would you would have uh, a connection on the jet bundle. But the jet bundle always comes uh, with a very uh, canonical uh, extension or uh, in fact filtration, which is the jet jet extension. And uh, for for that example, this uh, this splitting, sorry, not this splitting, this, um, um, this sequence that I need in order to start with the WKB is precisely the, you know, the jet, the jet extension is exactly uh, what you need to proceed. So, okay, so I'll, I'll end, I'll end on that note. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank so, you. Uh, let's now uh, ask for questions. Um, I have a question. I have Okay. Veronica, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nikita. So about this last thing, when you say um, the exact WKB flat section, so the way you will construct now the solution, like do you have, uh, um, you're going to solving this for S, and then you are going to do Borel uh, Laplace sum summation of S? Well, actually, it's it's even more, I'm glad you asked that question, but it's it's even more interesting than that. If you look at this slide, I have uh, the you know the letter h bar or anything that would resemble h bar appears nowhere in here. So actually, the the other point I would like to make is that the WKB method itself has nothing to do uh, at the core of it has nothing to do with perturbation theory. Um, and uh, this is I, I like to emphasize this point that when we when we think of 
you know, the, the WKB method, or in particular, exact WKB method, this, its effectiveness. There's really two steps there. The first one is this kind of ingenious method where you, you search for a particular structure on your object, whether it's a connection or a differential operator with a line bundle. Um, and you, you kind of, you reduce the uh, amount of degrees of freedom that you have to worry about in your problem by doing this kind of funny uh, gauge transformation. Once, you, once you've done that, you arrive at, at a differential equation and then you apply uh, perturbation theory to solve that equation. Um, and those two steps are really separate. They're, they're separate pieces of mathematics. <laughs> Um, so if I, if I said that, uh, you know, um, let's start with not a connection, but an H bar connection, this thing would depend on H bar. Then basically what you would have is that there would be an H bar, uh, appearing here, or, or rather the better way to say it is that this reference connection, nabla not the diagonal that itself would be an H bar connection. And so what you would end up with is a, is a nonlinear, uh, first order equation this you know technically speaking i guess this would be a victorial equation uh but okay whatever um that would depend on h bar and um and the point is that this kind of equation is solvable in power series not exponential power series not trans series none none of that just in power series Yeah, and then of course you would uh, then you would worry about what would it mean to can you Borel resum it? Then that's that entire other kind of aspect of exact perturbation theory comes in. So if yeah. I don't, but so is this your strategy? At this point, you will put an H bar in front of uh, the connection. Yeah. And, okay. So let me actually. So this is what I want to finish with very quickly. So, uh, so my next slide was. Uh, you know, on the left-hand side, I have this traditional point of view. I start with a Schrodinger equation, right? We have this uh, WKB ansatz, and that leads to the Riccati equation. So here's what it all means, uh, right? And this is the geometric point of view. That's this is exactly what I just described. You have you have extension, uh, splitting. You look for splitting, etc. So and then you end up with this geometric Riccati. So uh, can I maybe take like three minutes to to uh, to explain uh, explain this? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so, 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 yeah, so the, the point of this slide is to convince you that what I, you know, this geometric point of view that I told you is not some kind of uh, gobbledygook, um, but actually has real world applications. <laughs> so, um, and here's how it goes. So when I, when I start, when I study a Schrodinger equation, it's a second order ODE, really, we need to understand that it's geometrically, it's a, it's a, an H bar deformed differential operator, second order, but on a very special bundle. The special bundle is this anti-canonical, anti-canonical bundle. The reason we want that is because, uh, well, we want in all coordinates, in all coordinate charts, we want to preserve this Schrodinger form where we don't have the first order derivative. Um, and another way, kind of more physical way of thinking about it is that sh solutions to the Schrodinger equation should be uh, wave functions and wave functions should be sort of square integrable. So it's something that it's basically there should be something that you, when you square it, when you square it, you should be able to integrate it. Um, so, uh, okay. Okay. Anyway, so the Schrodinger equation is really a, an operator on this very special bundle. And, um, and the, the point that I want to make is that when you sit down and say, I want to solve the Schrodinger equation using the WKB method, you already start by writing down something in, in a coordinate. This is, this is kind of, you, that, that's your starting point. I'm going to write down my equation in my coordinate X. But uh, this is really a choice that you've made. It's a choice that you've made. You could have made a different choice. And geometrically, what this choice uh, implies is the following. Um, if, I, if I look at this H bar differential operator on this line bundle L, I'll promote it to a connection. Uh, on the jet bundle. So this is the first jet, first jet bundle. That's what I call E. And that uh, has an upper structure, exactly what I need uh, for this thing to, to start going. So it's a, it's a sequence. It's an extension of E by the line bundle L and the line bundle L uh, tends to the canonical, canonical bundle. And when you said that I want to uh, study this Schrodinger equation in this coordinate X, 
that means you've chosen the coordinate x and because all the line bundles and vector bundles involved are these very canonical objects this simple choice of a coordinate induces canonical trivializations of them so i have a canonical bundle uh, once I fix the coordinate x, it, it gets canonically trivialized over your coordinate charts because it has the generator dx. And uh, because I have uh, a square root, uh, you know, I, I fixed the square root of the canonical bundle, that gets uh, a canonical, tr uh, uh, canonical trivialization, whatever, square root dx, whatever that means. So that means my jet bundle E um, which is really a splitting, sorry, which is really a direct sum now of two trivial bundles uh, generated by these, by these vectors um, is, well, it's of this form. So, and, um, right. Uh, so my reference connection that I will pick is, is just uh, the kind of simple uh, H bar, the simplest H bar connection, which is the trivial H bar connection. Uh, it's supposed to be a diagonal connection on this uh, reference splitting. Well, I take these generators as flat generators for my diagonal connection. Um, so it has this form. So if I write my Schrodinger equation or, or the connection that comes from the Schrodinger equation in terms of the uh, in terms of this diagonal reference connection, I end up with uh, an endomorphism uh, which has this form. This is a very familiar form uh, when you study these uh, Schrodinger equations uh, as connections. And, and now, so this is my phi. If I literally just look at this equation and plug in, uh, you know, the values of phi, uh, given this expression, you see that I recover precisely the, the Schrodinger equation. Great. But I mean, somehow, then there is the next steps, namely, is you know perturbation theory then is yes. this real summable and uh, uh, question is is there also a geometric object that houses the Borel summed object very good question uh and i don't have a good answer to that um but i do think um that there are interesting groupoids or re re groupoid representations that are involved um, and I think, I, I mean, I certainly uh, am not in a position to say anything uh, um, precise about this yet. Uh, but my my understanding is that uh, there there is a groupoid um, involved, uh, it, which is a it's a kind of a twist of the fundamental groupoid, um, and. Uh, you should view formal WKB solutions as kind of formal representations of uh, of this groupoid. Um, and if you pull them back to the total space of the groupoid, then uh, the Borel resummation procedure becomes uh, an actual uh, automorphism on the groupoid, uh, which sends the, the this formal thing to uh, to a holomorphic a formal representation to a holomorphic representation. Um, that's that's a very vague. Um, and and isn't this groupoid somewhat finite in the sense that it, shouldn't it maybe be your adjoint cover or or this, which is this the double? Um, Well, okay. The, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the this adjoint spectral cover definitely plays an important role um, in this groupoid story. Um, yeah, but I, I definitely at, at this point it's just it's a bit too uh, too fresh for me to to say anything particularly precise about this. It, it comes back a little bit to your th main theorem, where I was a little bit surprised to still see the eyes because there should somehow be a a formulation of your your main theorem in section three here, uh, which right. would be completely independent of I, right? I mean, that was the whole point of introducing this adjoint cover. That's right. Um, this the reason is that um, this is a local statement. Um, yeah. This is a this is a local existence. Um, 
there yeah, so there's some kind of uniqueness that allows you to say that this will propagate all over the cover, maybe with some poles or singularities. That, that correct, correct. Yeah. So the way you should think of it is when I when I when I chose this lambda i, what I really did choose is a point on the spectral curve above, above x naught. Um, so kind of using this formulation of the joint spectral cover uh, and all the rest of it. Um, um yeah the the way the way you should treat you know i i used indeed i i'm using this label i here but really what i'm implying here is i'm i'm choosing a point on the spectral curve and it doesn't matter how i've na i've numbered my sheets uh you know like in in this entire formulation uh the way i've trivial basically the way i've trivialized the spectral curve no longer plays any role all right mm -hmm. Yeah, and so therefore there, there should yeah. be a formulation that just involves starting with a point on on that cover, right? I mean, sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I like, uh, I love the application of the Danish uh, letter A in your theorem. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I, I kind of uh, hijacked your question, Veronica. Did, did, you should continue if there's more questions. <laughs> Maybe just a, a, since we are, we went back to this theorem, like the uniform uh, um, estimate that you get uh, is something that okay, it comes from uh, the pure analysis, uh, or uh, is like another reason why you should expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I certainly won't be able to kind of explain the ideas of the proof in a few seconds, uh, but. At the at the core of it, the way this theorem is proved is is a is a very kind of um, classical approach of uh, uh, doing um, what I call the, what is called the method of successive approximation. So you you basically um, you start with this ODE, uh, you transform it into this nonlinear ODE that you want to solve, and then the important step. Uh, from my point of view, is, is to further transform that into a nonlinear system. Somehow, I always want to work with first-order things, so it's a first-order nonlinear system rather than a an nth or, or whatever n minus one order differential scalar equation. Uh, so once you start with that, then there's a bunch of operations. Which, uh, okay, funny story. I, when I was writing the paper, I spent a lot of time thinking about how, how like I need to I need to make this transformation and then I need to make this transformation and kind of how am I going to explain this to people that this you know that this makes sense because uh, this looks horrible so then I uh, I had a, an old book about like chaos and dynamics or something and I just decided to open that and I realized that many of the steps involved are really absolutely kind of classical operations in differential equations except that of course they're not formulated in this singular perturbation theory context so anyway, so there's a bunch of kind of linearization of the system around the leading order solution type of thing. Um, but then at the end, you kind of boil it down to a system in a normal form, which you need to solve. And the way you solve it is by applying uh, the Borel transform and, um, and solving the resulting Borel transformed equation using uh, method of successive approximation. So you, you literally write down a system, uh, uh, sorry, a sequence of kind of approximating solutions, you sum them up, um, show that the whole thing converges. So that's that's the analysis part. Um, but in a way, kind of what I like about it, uh, this, this may be a good or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. But if you look at the proof, you could have uh, perfectly, like if this proof appeared in uh, a textbook from the 1960s, you would have said you would have kind of said this makes perfect sense um you know like it's uh it, it, it looks kind of it, it definitely looks like a proof that should have appeared in a in a textbook from the 1960s like you open vaso's textbook and it's uh it's kind of the same language more or less okay yeah thanks <laughs> more questions Well, 
maybe not. It appears not. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Nikita again. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you at the at the next uh, seminar. I hope. And uh, many thanks to for your talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right. Okay. All right. So I'll send you I'll send you an email, Yon, with uh, with all the things that I have in my list. <laughs> Please do. That'll be great. All right. Okay, guys. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye.